Welcome to our initial segment of our Finger Lakes history. I'm Seneca County historian Walt Gable and I will be narrating these programs. Our program today is dealing with the Seneca Army Depot, its history from its very beginning up to the present. You'll notice on the uh, screen projector is the book, The Seneca Army Depot, Fighting Wars from the New York Home Front. It was published by the History Press in 2012, and it is an outgrowth of 2011 programs prepared by local historians. We gathered so much information that we thought was so significant that it needed to be put in book form. And I'll be working from a lot of the information in that book uh, in today's program. If you look at the map, you will see that this shows the location of the original 500 plus igloos that were in rows. And, and it also shows things that are existing yet today or now today on the former Seneca Army Depot, such as the Five Points Correctional Facility. Now the location of the Seneca Army Depot uh, the actual site selection was a very involved process, but to begin to tell that story, we really need to deal with a brief history of this area before 1941. Seneca County was the westernmost part of the military tract that was established by the state of New York to give land to Revolutionary War veterans the area roughly from east of Syracuse to as far west as Seneca Lake was surveyed and then by lottery or ballot lands were given. And so the towns of Romulus and Varick in Seneca County where the Seneca Army Depot would be located in 1941 were part of this military tract. The map on the right shows a close up of that area of Seneca County. The selection of Seneca County uh, is a story that's going to become very important, but to help understand that selection, we need to look at what was really true of this area before 1941. The key thing is that it was primarily an agricultural area. There was a lot of dairy farming and there was a lot of production of cash grain crops as well as fruits such as peaches and grapes. Now over 60 sites were under consideration uh, for the munitions supply base that was going to be established as planned by the Franklin Roosevelt administration to help provide defense against possible enemy air attack of the northeastern quarter of the United States. Before the United States formally entered the war, the Franklin Roosevelt administration, realizing that sooner or later we were going to be drawn into that war, that we needed to be prepared for that war. And part of his defense buildup was the idea that there needed to be four different munitions supply bases established, two protecting the Atlantic Coast area and two protecting the Pacific Coast area should there be enemy air attack on the United States. Now, there are several significant reasons as to why this Seneca County site was selected as opposed to the over 60 other sites that were under consideration for this munitions supply base for the northeastern part of the United States. One very important factor was that there were already in place rail lines that will be on the east and west side of the base when it was constructed. Today we don't think that rail lines are that significantly uh, important or even crucial, but we have to go back more than 70 years to when rail lines were crucially important for the movement of goods in the United States. 
these munitions supply bases needed to be fairly close to the coast, but they also needed to be in a fairly remote area. And so Seneca County, being approximately 250 miles west of New York City, would certainly help with that. It was also quickly identified that right underneath the few inches of topsoil in that area, there was an extensive layer of shale. That would be very crucial in absorbing the explosive impact should there be an explosion. Seneca County land was clearly cheaper than was land in a lot of the other sites that were under consideration. It was also perceived that Seneca County residents were good, patriotic American citizens, and going along with that, there was also the realization by the Army Department that Seneca County residents, mid-Seneca County residents especially, did not have any organized efforts. They wouldn't be able to mount any organized opposition to locating their base there and meaning that they would have to give up their property. Now, as probably today we cynically think politics was involved prob in all probability. My high school history teacher, Miss Ethel Buckley, would tell the story that our congressman at the time was John Tabor from Auburn. He was the ranking Republican on the House Appropriations Committee. He had a wonderful nickname. His nickname was Meat Axe John. He probably got that nickname because he had such a reputation of going through the Franklin Roosevelt submitted budgets to Congress and cutting out all of the unnecessary spending in his proposals, just like the uh, butcher would go through with a meat axe and cut off the excess fat before you do the fine trimming of the meat. Obviously, Franklin Roosevelt wanted bipartisan support for his defense appropriations. And so gaining the support of the ranking Republican on the House Appropriations Committee would be a, a wonderful way to enhance the odds that his defense programs would be approved. Well, what we know is that early in 1941, John Tabor, like most Republicans, was opposed to the increased defense appropriation proposals coming from the Franklin Roosevelt administration. However, all of a sudden, Franklin Roosevelt found that John Tabor became an outspoken supporter of the proposals including these four additional munition supply bases. Could it be that there was a private understanding that in exchange for John Tabor's support for the Franklin Roosevelt appropriations for defense spending, that one of those military bases would be located here in his congressional district? Complicating that still further, we have the fact that the Seneca County Democratic Party chairperson, James Boyle, was frequently on the phone and going to Washington to lobby on behalf of a site being selected here in Seneca County. Now, I'm basing all of this information on my interview with a good, good dear friend of mine who's now passed away, Charmian Boyle, daughter of this James Boyle. Charm says, I felt like I was a secretary for my father all of that spring because I was so busy taking telephone messages when he wasn't at home. Now, was politics involved? We can only conjecture. Probably today, when we're more cynical about politics in general, we're more inclined to believe that there was something there. Do we have any smoking gun uh, evidence that this kind of a understanding took place between Tabor 
and the Franklin Roosevelt administration staff? No, but it certainly there is a lot of coincidental information. So the Seneca County site was selected. It was on June 10th that there was a public meeting that for the first time publicly we had representatives of the Department of the Army in the area saying that this was going to be the site that was selected. As a matter of fact, according to official Army Department records, it isn't until the next day, June 11th, that they say the site was actually selected. So this just begins to show, and I'll have more to say about this later, how there, things were moving so fast that one part within the Army Department was not keeping complete coordinated tabs with other parts within the Army Department. But anyways, this public meeting on June 10th is the first time that officially local people learned that this is going to happen, that this site is being selected. There are over 100 farm families in the area and they are learning that they are going to have to vacate their property in a relatively short period of time. In addition to those farm families, we have two churches and we have some uh, agricultural businesses, some fruit packing warehouses and so on that are located on this area. And this is happening during the harvest season, a peak time of activity for farmers, of course. Now, the next picture shows that we have uh, a clipping from the Syracuse Post Standard in which the writer of this article, I think rather poetically, tries to suggest the transformation from fields that are going to be glowing yellow as the grain is ripening for harvest are going to be transformed into munitions igloos where uh, ammunition and shells are going to be stored. Uh, a major change is going to happen. Now, throughout all of this process, the Army Department had public relations people that were trying to uh, make it very positively presented what was happening. Here you see a picture of Mr. and Mrs. John Lisk, and you can see that they would probably be your typically perceived farm family of the time. And the media from the Army Department wrote this quote that she was to be saying, I'd rather give my farm to the government now to make America strong than to see another woman give her son's life to the defense of the country when we didn't prepare. At the very bottom, you'll see a newspaper headline that says this family, along with two or three other families, were given a notice that they had only three days to vacate their property. Now, just imagine yourself today. If you were all of a sudden told that you had three days to vacate your property, what would your reaction be? Probably it would be, no way, simply couldn't do it. But they had to do it. Now, for these farm families, many of them, it was a particularly difficult hardship. The reality, number one, that the farm family may very well have been in that farm family for several generations. Giving up your homestead is not going to be an easy thing to do. You probably have to decide what are you going to take, what are you going to leave behind. You also have the realization that for these farm families, it was coming at harvest time. You mean you're not going to harvest this crop that's almost ripe for harvest? 
And this is coming at a time where we're, we're in the midst of the depression and people are in food lines, you know, yet unemployed. How can you just simply plow down crops and not harvest them? Well, the process is shown in, in this set of pictures. Every property was numbered and the house was given the letter A and the biggest barn a letter B and the other outbuildings a level C a letter C and so on. And so you can see that house number and the letter on the house that's shown. Families could move what they wanted to. Maybe it was a corn crib. Maybe it was what they could fit in several trips on, the, uh, on their truck. But then you had families with little children, such as illustrated by the three little girls. They were all sisters. Imagine what must have been going through their mind in the short period of time that they had to try to move. They didn't understand really what was taking place. And they probably the first night after they moved said, when are we going home, mommy? Now the next uh, frame is particularly interesting because one of the farm families that was given only three days to vacate was the Barton Van Riper farm family. And on the right, you will notice a letter dated July 22nd from the Department of the Army. And it says that the family has three days to vacate. But the letter on the left, which is the Army Department's official notice of acceptance of the purchase of the property, is dated the next day. And I think this illustrates that things were moving so fast within the Army Department to bring about the, this Seneca Ordnance Depot that uh, there was not day-to-day -day coordination within the Army Department itself. Now, to help uh, make this all possible, of course, the lands had to be appraised for what was considered an appropriate value. The uh, deed searches had to be done. The Seneca County Clerk's Office was given additional staff and it was working 24 seven. But a reality for doing deed searches on some properties is that there were no clear titles to the deeds of some property. And this is where the Army Department accepted the information provided by this 84-year-old gentleman who had lived all his life in the area, his name is Charlie Dunlap. He says, well, you know, I knew who lived here, and then before them it was this person, and before them it was this person. And the Army Department was, was willing to accept the information provided by Charlie Dunlap where they couldn't clearly research the deeds. Now, the... Army Department bought the property. If the property seller wanted to, he or she could buy back the house or any other building uh, from the federal government as, and move it as long as the move was completed prior to the time that the Army Department wanted to come into that particular area for construction to begin, and you can see some of the pictures of houses that are being moved. The Barton Van Riper family, for example, they bought back the chicken coop, moved it to their uh, property on Cuga Lake, and they kept building on it, and eventually that was their home as it exists today. Now, because of the hardships of over 100 farm families being forced off their property that summer of 1941, we local historians very definitely wanted a historic marker that would pay tribute to them. And the next year, of course, farm families were moved from the Samson area to make way for the Samson Naval Station. So on the east side of Route 96A, right across from the entrance to Samson State Park today, on July 12, 2012, we had uh, the dedication of this historic marker that finally paid tribute to the hardship and sacrifice that over a hundred farm families had to make as they moved off their property. Now, 
as I said, there were two churches on the property that was taken over for the Seneca Ordnance Depot. Upper left shows the picture of the Wesleyan Methodist Church. My, one of my great-grandfathers, Reverend jo J Joseph Cook, was actually a pastor there at one time. At the bottom, you see the picture of the Kandaya Baptist Church, officially known as the First Baptist Church of Romulus, New York. And it had a cemetery around it. And the Army Department p pledged that it would keep access to that cemetery for those families that had burial plots there. And the Army Department did keep its promise. And on the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend in 2013, uh, several of us local historians gathered and placed a wreath there at the cemetery to thank the Army Department for keeping its promise. Now, this is an aerial view that was taken February of this year, 2016, by Dennis Money from a helicopter. And you can see the two sections of the cemetery, and you can see the spot in the center where the Kendea Baptist Church was located. In the mid-1950s, it was taken apart section by section and reconstructed at Old Irelandville. Well, on to the main thing. This site is chosen to become the Seneca Ordnance Depot, and the construction of the Seneca Ordnance Depot was the largest construction program to take place in Seneca County up to that time. Over 500 munitions igloos are going to be constructed. The original timeline, you can see here that on-site visits were done the last day of March, first day of April, June 10th, 1941. There was the uh, public meeting that the decision is being made that this is going to be the site for this munitions depot and construction, actual construction, is going to begin on July 9th. So that means less than one month after there was the first public official n announcement that this was going to be the site, construction is going to begin. Of course, it's going to be a lot of infrastructure development, and you can see it here. You have to get the closed Kendaya Railroad Station back into operation. You've got to set up a temporary headquarters. You've got to build access roads into this farmland area for the way you want them. You have to build railroad spurs the way you want them to have access to the different buildings that will be constructed. This was an area that did not have any kind of a city water system, so that had to be constructed. There was very, very limited, at best, electrical service and very limited telephone service, and so there needed to be more. The temporary headquarters happened to be a former fruit packing warehouse. They added on to it, as shown in this next picture, and uh, it was described as being almost a bedlam the way it was. They set up sawhorses and planks for tables and desks until they could get desks. They had workers, such as the secretaries, working by candlelight or kerosene lamps until adequate electrical service could be shown or installed, excuse me. And then here you see some pictures at the lower right of a secretary working by a kerosene lamp. Upper left, there was no break or lunch room for the uh, secretary, so they took turns eating their lunches in their uh, fellow secretary's uh, cars. Now, getting the railroad station, which is shown in this, next, in this picture, uh, up to snuff, there was imported large quantities of heavy construction equipment that was going to be needed. Here you see an aerial view from later 1941, clearly showing the construction of the 500 igloos that will be completed before Thanksgiving of that year. You can see how they are laid out in rows for access and how they are spaced far enough apart 
that the commander for the construction project said that if it should happen that one of these accidentally exploded because of munitions in it or there was a bombing that took place and hit one of these igloos, one igloo would explode without setting off the other igloos. This is the probably most famous picture associated with the construction of the depot. It shows how the concrete was poured. There were two uh, metal shells spaced approximately a foot to a foot and a half apart, and the concrete was poured into those shells, and it hardened. And so there was not construction that took place down into the ground. It was kind of a semicircular construction taking place above ground. Now, two world records for construction were set. Remember that we are not in the war yet, but we are anticipating. The Franklin and Roosevelt administration is planning for us coming into the war. And as it becomes clearer that we're going to get into the war even sooner than we think, especially with the surprise attack of Pearl Harbor that comes in December, uh, the timeline for completion of construction is being moved up. Originally, it was May of 1942, but uh, early in the fall of 1941, the decision was made that these igloos have to be all completed before cold weather sets in. And in upstate New York, that could be any time from Thanksgiving on. So what happened? Although there was the desire to hire as many workers as possible locally, as the timeline for construction was shortened, moved up, more and more workers had to be hired. And many came from Buffalo and New York City, for example. You'll notice the week of October uh, 23rd that there were over 8,800 construction workers employed at the Seneca Ordnance Depot. That's workers only employed in construction. These headlines from local newspapers show, you know, just the magnitude of what was happening. There's a wonderful story of a young man from Clyde. He came with his friend. They had just graduated from the high school that June and the friend was going to get a job at the depot because he wasn't going on to college. But this Mr. Frantangelo, as I want to call him, he comes with his friend to make sure the paperwork is being filled out by his friend properly. And when he's there being, uh, while that paperwork is being completed, one of the uh, hiring staff persons said to Mr. Frantangelo, why aren't you applying? He says, well, I'm going to Syracuse University in September. I can't uh, get a job here. And the staff person says, well, we can hire you for the summer. And you're a strapping young American man. And so he filled out the paperwork. He was hired for the summer at a good rate. He never went to Syracuse University. These pictures show some of the employment. The local grange in Candea, that building was used as a local employment office. And the lower right picture shows uh, applicants filling out their paperwork. Now, in the case of many of the workers, that were married, they brought their families with them. It was a fun kind of an experience for that summer. You're camping away and so on. You're uh, making your own makeshift tents as need be. Uh, the lower right picture shows uh, an old bus that was abandoned. Three different families took their turns sleeping on cots one night out of every three uh, inside that bus. In the Kandea area, there was only one well from which these camping worker families could get water to uh, drink. There was no sewer system, and so they were using outhouses, and very quickly they became just uh, a major source of concern. And the state health department had to step in and 
close them. And they had to say that campgrounds couldn't continue to operate unless they were inspected and meeting minimal equi uh, requirement, health requirements. And the single young men that came to work on the weekend, it was a common practice for them to just sleep on mattresses in large rooms in buildings such as the Dove Building in nearby Geneva. But eventually things were so bad, the housing problems were so serious a concern that the federal government, although it initially did not want to, brought in trailers and they leased the interior of the racetrack of the Seneca County Fairgrounds in Waterloo for uh, worker families to live in trailers like these. Here you can just see some of the uh, construction facts that were taken from a November 1941 newspaper article. The figure of $11 million seems kind of paltry today, but we have to remember that's 1941, not 2016. Now, there were two hamlets as uh, being shown in this next picture, uh, that uh, were carrying a, on the local demands for food, beverages, whatever. And they were in Candea and in Romulus. Candea, which was a hamlet of 300 people, became a hamlet of 6,000 people that summer. For the hamlet of Romulus, one reporter said it was like moving New York Times Square into Romulus. I think that begins to give you an idea of how a sleepy little agricultural area hamlet becomes a thriving, almost kind of a metropolis within a few weeks' time. Well, December 7th, Pearl Harbor attack, the United States comes into the war, and this munitions supply base is operational at that time, but its mission is greatly expanded. It is now going to become a major supply base for all kinds of activity in the European theater of World War II, and we're going to focus on that uh, in the next several frames. One of those things as shown he, in the next is that we have Italian POWs living and working at the depot in the last year and a half of World War II. Uh, labor shortages were so intense that uh, uh, women alone couldn't create and fill all of the jobs that needed to be uh, filled. And so uh, after the fall of Mussolini at the Seneca Ordnance Depot, like other mil U.S. military bases around the country, uh, Italian POWs who now pledged loyalty to the United States government uh, were allowed to come and provide important kind of work. Because they were Italian, they were very frequent visitors on the weekend to the SMS Lodge in Seneca Falls. That's an Italian mutual benefit uh, association that had been in existence since shortly after 1900. Uh, they were also taken to on the weekend to dances at the Masonic Lodge in Lodi and so on like that. And people from the area on Sunday afternoon could go to the area on the depot where the Italians uh, were housed and uh, mingle with the Italian POWs. It was also during the war that a very interesting thing happened according to John Stahl. All of a sudden he was told that as a forklift, tr forklift truck operator he was going to handle something and he noticed that it was labeled Manhattan and he couldn't understand why something that was bound for him uh, was to go to Manhattan was here at the Seneca Ordnance Depot. But uh, it was very clear that there were very, very specific regulations as to how the items were to be handled. And all of the bigwigs, as he called it, the top officials had to come and make sure that it was being handled properly. It was only later, of course, that he found out 
that this was, these materials were part of the Manhattan Project for the development of the atomic bomb. Women played a crucial role in the labor force at the Seneca Ordnance Depot during World War II. Many were secretaries, they worked on the munitions uh, handling lines, but also many were forklift truck operators. And here you see a famous uh, picture that was in all of the newspapers of a woman handling a large uh, ammunition shell on her forklift truck. And the next picture shows another lady that was a very important forklift truck operator. I had a cousin that was a forklift truck later, truck, Ford, cliff truck operator lady. <laughs> Can't say that. Now, outside of the depot, women played another crucial role, and that was as volunteers helping to watch in the skies day and night. This was true all the way from Lake Ontario to south of uh, Ithaca, watching to see if perchance an enemy aircraft was approaching, an aircraft that might be trying to bomb the Seneca Ordnance Depot. Now, I said, during the war, the munitions supply role of the depot was greatly expanded to all kinds of equipment. After the war, what's going to be the future of the depot? Is it going to be closed? No. It's going to become a major supply storage space, bringing back items from the European theater and storing them if there is a future war. Handling ammunition and storing it, getting rid of ammunition that is aged and spent in that sense. So uh, we have those kinds of things happening. Another specific thing happens starting in the mid-1950s. We have a, the Seneca Ordnance Depot taking on a new role, and that is the so-called North Depot activity for special weapons. Now, special weapons is the phrase that the Department of Defense, at now, after World War II, used to refer to nuclear weapons or nuclear weapons components. The official policy of the Defense Department is they never will confirm nor deny that a specific site was a site for nuclear, nuclear weapons. But they refer in their material to special weapons. And when you have military police, specially trained military police being brought in to the North Depot section of the Seneca Army Depot to provide enhanced security, and you look at the additional kind of fence security that was put around the Q area, as the Defense Department called it, then you have all of the conditions, all of the criteria that the Defense Department uh, felt were necessary where there were going to be nuclear weapons. Now, here you see some of the other operations that were taking place at the Seneca Army Depot after World War II. At the top, there is the manganese ore being stored. At the bottom, they are processing different kinds of ammunition. Jeeps were being stored. Here you see an inspector looking at different kinds of large weaponry that is being stored. These, are, of course, are not nuclear weapons. The lower right, when it, ammunition got too old and couldn't be uh, safely kept or used anymore, it was simply detonated in the demolition pits. That's going to be a cause of uh, pollution, uh, probably, for uh, consideration uh, more recently. Now, Lower left here, you see in the center the image of a white deer. 
The Seneca Ordnance Depot, and it was renamed the Seneca Army Depot, was enclosed by a fence. And when they enclosed that rural area, there were a lot of deer from the very beginning that were enclosed inside the fence. Now, true, they could jump the fence, but the enclosure of the fence gave them a lot of additional security from would-be common predators. Now, the white-tailed deer have a recessive gene that does allow for them in their breeding to have a white skin. They are not albinos, but to have a white skin. And because of the safety of the fence and their protection, therefore, from natural predators, we have several white-appearing, white-tailed deer within the Seneca Army Depot. And they became the unofficial symbol of the Seneca Army Depot. And you can see how it's even used above that in the uh, anniversary envelope. And pictures of the white deer along with the brown uh, white-tailed deer is shown in the lower right. Now, the, what you see in the upper right is the last nuclear bomb that was processed for removal from the Seneca Army Depot. Now, in 1983, we have the first instance on any United States government-owned facility of anti-nuclear weapons demonstrations. The presence of these special weapons was so widely assumed that there was a mounted concerted effort in 1983, that summer and fall, by the women for a in camp, women's encampment for a future of peace and justice, as well as notable people such as Dr. Spock to come and participate in the anti-nuclear weapons demonstrations that summer and fall. Now, you see in, at the right a picture of a mass gathering trying to close one of the entry bases. There's the wonderful story that uh, Robert Zemanek Jr., who was the public relations officer for the depot at the time, told me that on one day, the Women's Encampment for a Future of Peace and Justice announced to the press, and it was on the local radio station for the noon news, that they had successfully that day closed every access gate to the depot, and the depot was closed. And when Zemanek reported that to the commander of the depot, he says, I want an immediate inventory count done of how many workers are actually here working today. And when they did the count, they found that there were more workers actually working on site that day than what was true of the average day. So the women's encampment group might have claimed that they closed the depot by closing access to all of the gates. They did not actually do so. However, going back to Dr. Spock, there's a wonderful story about him. The morning that he was going to be arrested in an act of civil disobedience by climbing over the fence, his wife went to Zemanek and said, he's too old. He's too old to climb over the fence. Can't you just simply open the fence or open a gate and let him walk through and trespass and get arrested. And Zemanek said, we make no special arrangements, ma'am, for any protesters. However, what happened was security people inside the fence helped as well as uh, protesters outside the fence. They put blankets over the barbed wire at the top of the fence and they helped Spock over the fence and he got arrested in an act of civil disobedience in the protest. Now, what was all of this special weapons? Where were they? Well, this is the infamous building that is not a building. It was made to look like a building so that Russian spy satellites would think it was a building. All it was was down underneath that building is in the vaults where, where the fuses for the nuclear weapons were stored. Here you see in the next picture 
the administration building for the Q area where the new special weapons were maintained. And it is heavily bunkered on every corner that if would-be attackers manage to get through two sections of barbed wire fence with a high voltage electrical fence in between and were approaching this administration building, there would be those concrete bunkers on the corners where trained marksmen with their special weapons, excuse me, their weapons, not nuclear weapons, could shoot them. Now, the next picture shows what today the entry gate to this queue area looks like. And I'll be honest and say the few times in recent years that I have just seven, simply driven through that entrance gate area has given me a very queasy kind of feeling because it just brings back to me so clearly how intense the security was at that area. Now, a very interesting ev event happened on July 30th of 1983. Coincidentally, it was the day I was moving into my house <laughs> in Seneca Falls. The ladies for the women's encampment had spent the night in the basement of the Presbyterian Church in Seneca Falls, and they were marching to Waterloo, and then they were going to Romulus to officially open their women's encampment for a future of peace and justice. But local rednecks stopped them from crossing a bridge in Waterloo, and for several hours there was just a plain standoff. As the news got out about this event, one local resident, Mrs. Mellie Clemen, she came and joined with the ladies. And when they were told, you either disperse from where you are stopped or you'll be arrested, they did not move. They got arrested. And that's Mellie Clemens' mugshot. She was released later that night. None of them were ever given uh, actual formal charges. Now, We get to the situation where after various kinds of nuclear weapons treaties are reached with the Soviet Union, the special weapons are withdrawn from the Q area, from the North Depot activity. And it is clear that the future of the base is very much in question. As a matter of fact, the Army Department was interested in just simply closing the base. And that was going to be an extreme hardship for the workers there. They would be out of a job, many of them close to retirement, uh, virtually all of them with families to support. What are they going to do, you know? This is at a time when the decline of industrial jobs is so widespread here in the area. Well, there were organizations, SOS, Save Our Seneca, COBRA, Keep Our Base at Romulus Alive. They were local efforts to f stop the Army Department from closing the base or at least force the Army Department to follow the base realignment and closure procedure, the BRAC process, to close the base. Now, the base is going to be closed, but by following the BRAC process, all of the workers at the depot had additional time to work, additional time to acquire enough years so that they could get a retirement, or additional time so at least they could move to get a better job. And the formal base closure ceremony is shown there. It happened in 2000. Well, as part of our cons programs in 2011 about the history of the depot, uh, I got the Seneca County Board of Supervisors to pay for this historic marker that is placed at the former main gate uh, on Route 96. And it just simply is a public recognition of the existence of the Seneca Army depot. But with the depot being closed, 
eventually much of the property is going to be turned back to Seneca County and what's going to happen to that area. Well, we can see in this next frame that some of the depot area has become the Five Points Correctional Facility, a major prison, state prison. We have the new Seneca County Jail and Sheriff's Office being at the Seneca County Law Enforcement Center. Uh, a portion of the more northern part of the former depot became uh, Kids Peace Seneca Woods Campus, and, uh, and then it became part of Hillside Children's Center. We have the Finger Lakes Technology Group that leases the entire Q area and they carry on their operations there. Some of the warehouses that were constructed in 1942 have become the sites of such businesses as the Advantage Group, which is refurbishing uh, restaurant equipment. But we have thousands of acres, about 7,000 acres of the former depot that the Seneca County Industrial Development Agency has been trying to market. And this aerial view, taken just a few years ago, you can see clearly how there are still, you can see the outlines of the roads for the former munitions igloos, but you can also see how there's been a lot of shrubbery uh, and tree growth as the area has not been maintained uh, for the way it was when the depot was operating by the Army Department. Here you see the airstrip. It was originally part of Sampson Air Force Base, but when that Air Force Base closed, it was turned over to the uh, Seneca Army Depot. And it is capable of handling the largest aircraft jets uh, that the Defense Department has today. In this next picture, you see the warehouses that were along Route 96A on the eastern and southern part of the depot. This next picture, you can see clearly how trees and shrubs are growing as these munitions igloos have not been maintained from when they were in active use. This next picture you can see the rows for the igloos, but in the very center, you will see the Kendea Baptist Church Cemetery, uh, which is still operational. In the upper right, you will see the Five Points Correctional Facility. Here you see some of the work of the Advantage Group, how they are refurbishing restaurant equipment. This is one of the munitions igloos that Finger Lakes Technology Group has refurbished. Those igloos were constructed so that there was a year-round uniform temperature of about 58 degrees. Finger Lakes Technology Group has been trying to uh, get museums, colleges and so on to understand that this would be a wonderful place for them to store off-site a lot of their artifacts and records that they simply don't have space for. Perhaps as since Katrina and the idea of the melting of the ice in our polar regions and the raising of the water level in New York City, Maybe the idea of a distant, off-site, safe storage spot will become more attractive. Fringle Lakes Technology Group says these would be also ideal places for backup storage of your computerized, digitalized records. But the future of the white deer has been so much an issue of concern in on the part of so many people in the entire upstate New York area and perhaps even nationwide and worldwide. Without the Army Department's efforts to protect 
these white deer by having a secure fence around the property, by keeping shrubs mowed down and an adequate food supply, the very existence of this white deer herd is in jeopardy. And this is, has been the largest herd of white deer in the entire world. Not the only herd, but the largest herd. And for many years, Seneca White Deer Incorporated, led by Dennis Money, has been actively pushing for something to be done to make sure that this white deer herd is preserved. And for a few years, they were able to conduct public tours of portions of the depot where people could see up front, up close, the white deer herd, the other wildlife such as the osprey that you see, or even an eagle, as well as turkeys, and so on here on the former depot property. Well, in 2015, the Seneca County Industrial Development Agency, after several years unsuccessfully mark, being able to market the area, tried a new approach, and they were going to accept sealed bids for all or part of the roughly 7,000 acres of land that they still had control over in the towns of Varick and Romulus. And they started a process. And in February, end of February, the sealed bids had to be in. They were reviewed by a committee consisting of members of the Board of Supervisors and members of the Seneca County IDA Board. And it was in June of this year that the Seneca County IDA Board unanimously accepted the proposal by Earl Martin. Earl Martin operates Seneca Iron Works, and he needs to expand from his plant in the town of Fayette. But as part of his proposal, he included things that seem to address a lot of the public outcry, outcry on key issues such as preservation of the white deer, such as getting a large portion of the land back on the tax rolls, and also an interest in reopening the previous county road that connected Route 96A in the hamlet of Romulus with, excuse me, Route 96 in the hamlet of Romulus with the uh, near Samson area on Route 96A. And so he is addressing all of those concerns. This spells out some of the details of how that is going to be. Just recently, he has announced that there will be Deer Haven Park LLC created to provide a sanctuary for the white deer and other wildlife. Well, I've been talking away here for about an hour, and I just want to say if anyone has uh, in need of more information, this is how you can contact me. Of course, you can buy the book, The Seneca Army Depot, which takes the story up to about 2010. And uh, that's available locally, uh, or you can buy it online, Amazon, uh, and so on, uh, from the History Press directly. But I thank you very much for this, uh, being listening to this first segment in our Finger Lakes history. And uh, in about a month, you will have another segment of our Finger Lakes history. <laughs>